Alrighty, welcome to this presentation on acid-base reactions. And we know that we can define both acids and bases in a variety of different ways into increasing levels of complexity, but perhaps the easiest definition to use, perhaps the simplest definition, is the Arrhenius definition. And according to Arrhenius, acids are just producers of hydrogen ions in solution, while bases produce hydroxide ions in solution. We can actually just look at two very simple strong acids and bases to illustrate these points. If we take some solid hydrochloric acid, we see that it disassociates in water to produce hydrogen ions and chloride ions. And so we see that when disassociated, an Arrhenius acid, or hydrochloric acid in general, produces these hydrogen ions. Similarly, if we take a strong base, let's choose sodium hydroxide in its solid form, we see, and I think you understand where this is going, sodium hydroxide disassociates to produce sodium ions with a positive charge and hydroxide ions. And again, according to Arrhenius, it's these hydroxide ions which give bases their characteristic properties, their bitter taste and slippery texture. But we also know that the Arrhenius definition isn't the only definition we can use to define acids and bases. We can use uh, an another definition called the Bronsted-Lowry definition with the cool slash through the O. And the Bronsted-Lowry definition says this. It says an acid is a proton donor, while a base is a proton acceptor. And this is a little more tricky. This is a little more hard to get your head around. But we're going to use this example down here, a reaction between a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, and a strong base, potassium hydroxide, to illustrate these points. So let's take a further look at this reaction. Again, hydrochloric acid is our strong base, excuse me, a strong acid, potassium hydroxide our strong base. We see products water and potassium chloride. Now let's take a look, a closer look at potassium chloride. We see that both these are both of our reactants are aqueous and potassium chloride is aqueous. Now we've learned from the precipitation reaction video that whenever we have ions, they're in the same state on both sides of the equation. They're both they're floating around in solution as both products and reactants. Well, then these are spectator ions. These are spectator ions. They don't actually participate in the reaction. They're just there for the ride. They're just there to watch hydrogen react with hydroxide to produce water. Spectator ions. And so if we write, again, something we learned in a previous video, the net ionic equation, our net ionic equation, which is just going to exclude those spectator ions, we see that all we have is some hydrogen, aqueous hydrogen ions, aqueous hydroxide ions, and these react together to produce liquid water, fittingly, in blue. Now, I think we can use this net ionic equation, and it's going to help us understand Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, or the Bronsted-Lowry definitions of acids and bases. So this proton is floating around in solution, and it eventually comes to rest in a water molecule. But where does this proton come from? Well, this proton, if we look back at our original equation, comes from, comes from hydrochloric acid. In other words, it's donated, it's donated by hydrochloric acid. And so in this way, hydrochloric acid functions as a Bronsted-Lowry base. To form water from hydroxide, we need a hydrogen ion, and that hydrogen ion can be donated from an acid, and that's what acids do. Similarly, for this hydrogen ion to come to rest, it has to be accepted by something, and it's accepted, the hydrogen ion is accepted by hydroxide. The kicker is that hydroxide, this hydroxide ion, comes from, again, if we look at our original equation, it comes from, from potassium hydroxide. So potassium hydroxide, or at least the hydroxide ion bit of potassium hydroxide, is eager to accept hydrogen ions. And in this case, they react together to produce water. And in, in general, whenever you have a reaction um, with acids and bases, with a strong acid and with a strong base, these are called neutralization reactions. Neutralization reactions reactions. And they're called neutralization reactions because we, we begin with a highly acidic compound and a highly basic compound, 
and we end with water, with water with a pH of 7, neither acidic nor basic. And so we take something that has highly extreme acidic and basic properties and essentially produce a neutral, a neutral product. But reactions between strong acids and strong bases aren't the only ones we can analyze. We can also analyze reactions between strong bases and weak acids. And so in this case, our strong base, sodium hydroxide, strong base, strong base, reacts with a weak acid, hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid. And again, our products are liquid water and an aqueous salt, sodium fluoride. But before we dig into the product side of the equation, let's look at the reactants. And le indeed, let's look more closely at the terms strong base and weak acid. By definition, a strong base disassociates completely, disassociates completely in water. Whenever we dump some solid sodium hydroxide into solution, we're not going to have any formula units of sodium attached to hydroxide floating around. We're just going to have independent sodium ions and independent hydroxide ions. On the other hand, a weak acid doesn't readily disassociate. So when we dump some of this into solution, we're going to have primarily blocks of HF bonded together floating around in solution. We're not going to have many hydrogen ions and fluoride ions. And that's because, again, this is a weak acid, and so it doesn't readily disassociate in solution. About 99% of the time, hydrofluoric acid is going to remain in this form, in HF form, when disassociated. So a very small percentage of the time, we're going to get an independent hydrogen and an independent fluoride. And so now you might be saying, well, what are our ions in this case? We know these kind of reactions involve the transfer of ions. What are our ions? What are the ions that we're working with? Well, we know we've got sodium and hydroxide, because sodium hydroxide disassociates readily. So we've got some sodium, we've got some hydroxide, but it looks like we just have HF as a unit in and of itself. It's neutral. It's not going to be very useful when we're reacting with sodium and hydroxide. The trick to looking at a reaction like this is to understand that hydroxide is an extremely strong base. It really, really wants to accept hydrogens. We know that from the Bronsted-Lowry definition, bases accept protons. And in this case, hydroxide really, really, really wants to accept this proton from hydrofluoric acid. So what it does is it actually breaks apart this hydrofluoric acid formula unit. So we don't have a bunch of bound HF floating around in solution. We actually do have, we actually do have hydrogen ions and accompanying fluoride ions. And we see again that this salt on the right hand side of our equation is aqueous like our sodium and fluoride ions originally. So these are again spectator ions. Spectator ions. And we again have exactly the same kind of acid base reaction. We see that hydrogen is going to react with water, excuse me, going to react with hydroxide to produce water. And so we see that originally, well, we might have thought that sodium hydroxide wouldn't really react with hydrofluoric acid because hydrofluoric acid wouldn't disassociate, it wouldn't make itself available to be reacted with. However, we understand that because sodium hydroxide is such a strong base, it can actually tear hydrofluoric acid apart and force it to react. And so what's our conclusion? Well, our conclusion is that strong bases can be assumed to react completely with weak acids. And so in our example, the strong base, sodium hydroxide, ended up reacting completely. All of these hydrogens in our hydro hydrofluoric acid sample reacted with the hydroxide and sodium hydroxide because of that tearing apart action. Now you may be wondering, well, can we just switch the terms acids and bases in this reaction? Can we just say strong acids can be assumed to react completely with weak bases? And that might make sense, but I'm going to tell you that it actually doesn't happen all the time. Now your textbook, the zoomed on textbook, doesn't really say doesn't really take the situation into account. It just says strong bases can be assumed to react completely with weak acids, but it doesn't address strong acids and weak bases. And so I found a little example which is probably beyond the scope of any test or any really even the AP exam, but it illustrates sort of why strong acids can't react completely with weak bases. And we'll use this example of hydrochloric acid, our strong acid, reacting with ammonia. And ammonia, in this case, is our weak base. And this is going to produce aqueous ammonium, 
and chloride ions. So you might say produce aqueous ammonium chloride. And we see ammonia is acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. It's taking this proton away, or it's, be, it's accepting this proton. Hydrochloric acid is donating a proton to ammonia to produce the polyatomic ion ammonium. And you might say, well, James, it looks like hydrochloric acid is reacting completely with ammonia. The trick is to look at what happens after this reaction or simultaneously with, with this reaction. The ammonium ions are aqueous. They're floating around in solution. And so they can, they're available to react with liquid water. Plus, let me put the state symbol there, aqueous plus liquid water. And they actually do react. And what happens is almost the reverse of this initial reaction. This hydrogen is taken off ammonia, ammonium, to produce ammonia. So we get NH3, NH3, which is again aqueous. And then the hydrogen is going to go to a water molecule and, and become a hydronium ion. And so we went from reactant, our ammonia, our ammonia atom, our ammonia um, molecule, to ammonium, our product. But then we went backwards in this next reaction to get our, some of our reactant back. And so whenever you add hydrochloric acid to a sample of ammonia, you're always going to have ammonia left over because the hydrochloric acid is never going to be able to react completely with ammonia, with this weak base. And so that explains why in this earlier example, well, sodium hydroxide could react completely with hydrofluoric acid because the hydroxide was available to become water. However, weak bases don't always have hydroxide in them. In fact, usually they don't have hydroxide. And so this leaves open the possibility for this kind of secondary reaction to occur and to make it difficult for strong acids to react with weak bases. But whenever you see a strong base and a weak acid, you'll know that that reaction goes to completion. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.